It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Steve Hurst all the way from San Diego. He was born and raised in San Diego. He graduated from UCLA School of Dentistry in 1993 and married his classmate, Dr. Bridget Hurst, in 1995. He spent two years with the Public Health Service and four years in a loan repayment program in Central California. In 2000, Steve and Bridget returned home to San Diego with three kids and currently practices general dentistry with a strong emphasis in implant dentistry. Dr. Hurst is a fellow of the California Implant Institute and was instrumental in starting C2's Live Surgical Implant Program in 2012. The program provides 50 U.S. patients a month with no-cost extractions, bone grafting, and noble biocare implants. Dr. Hurst is responsible for patient screening, initial CBCT diagnosis, surgical instruction, post-op follow-up, and final restorations, which includes crown and bridge, locator overdentures, and full mouth restorations. When he's not working, he enjoys surfing and spending time with his wife and four kids. Alex is the oldest and just applied to dental school. Congratulations, man. Yeah, Alexis, yeah. So, oh, Alexis, yeah, I'm sorry. Alexis, Alexis yeah. So yeah, she's, she's uh, just like her mama, huh? Well, yeah, you know, her uh, her mom's third generation, so that'll make Alexis fourth on her mom's side and third on mine. So genetically, she was done. She she didn't really have a choice. That is so cool. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people, I don't think they realize that a lot of our last names came from our occupation. Like Smith was a blacksmith, you know, putting uh, uh, horseshoes on a horse. And uh, a lot of, um, a lot of, when you go around the world, Family businesses are very common. I mean, you, you know, you go to these uh, countries, and if your father was a goat herder, I mean, that just seems <laughs> natural to follow the family business. I mean, you, you start with yeah. a huge advantage, you know. In, in Kansas, yeah. those wheat farms, I mean, some of those wheat farms have been in the family for hundreds of years. Yeah, uh, yeah. My family has a, a land in Nebraska that we just got a plaque for. I've been in the family over 100 years. So, yeah, good luck starting a farming career without, you know, inheriting some land. Yeah, what, what do they farm? Uh, corn? Corn, uh, soybeans, um, uh, what, a little milo, I guess, but mostly corn. Yeah, mostly corn. Amazing. So, you know, they say the fastest growing sector of the dental industry, number one fast growing is uh, clear liner and Visline, and number okay. two is implants. And I think the reason is obvious as I've done these podcasts from, you know, the, the 20 some countries is that a lot of people have insurance from the government or whatever that fixes our PPOs in America that fixes the fees on cleanings, exams, fillings and x-rays. And most of these dentists have extremely high overhead, but they never set the fee for Invisalign or dental implants. So a lot of, you know, I've been in dental offices in Cambodia, um, where they say, you know, we, we basically run at a break even, but if we pull one implant out per week, at fee for service and i do 50 implants a year that's how i make my money so yeah so implants are really booming um but a lot of people are scared so i so i want to tell you that most podcasters uh, listen to are born after 1980 so i know your audience is uh more closer to uh, lexus stage than our age and they're all saying the same thing. They're commuting to work right now. They're saying, Steve, I just got out of dental school. We didn't place one implant. I don't, I don't even know where to start. How, how do I go from zero to one? Yeah, I would say um, there's never been a better time than now to start getting into it. So, um, you know, five, six years ago, I, I, I'd restored a few implants, but I wasn't doing any implants, but I, I kind of could see the writing on the wall. And my God, I loved it when somebody came in and all I had to do was tighten a screw, put in a little Teflon tape, a little composite, and that was my uh, screw retained crown. That's the, and the, the fees are great. So, I mean, implant dentistry, like you said, it, it gives you an opportunity to kind of beat the PPO monster. Um, and, and God knows people need this. So, so anyways, I, I was looking for a, a live course. I, I didn't want to take another class and then come home and be too scared to place an implant. Um, I had a buddy take a MISH class and when it was all done. He just he said he was just too too petrified to do anything. And I didn't want to do that. So I, I'm lucky. I, I uh, happened to live within a few miles of the California Implant Institute. They call it CII. Um, and uh, I happen to own a, a, a surf condo down in Mexico. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if I could write off this surf condo by somehow getting it involved with dentistry? So 
Um, I knew there were live courses, but there wasn't anything on the West Coast. So I uh, approached Louis Alfarage, the, the founder of the California Implant Institute. I said, let's do something. He, he kind of looked at me and said, OK, well, you know, let's let's go take a look at your condo. Let's see what it looks like. We ended up renting a condo next door to mine. We took out the furniture. We put in a couple chairs. And in 2012, we did our first course. We had three chairs. Um, in 2013, we had three courses. Our average course will last five days. Um, we'll probably see 50 to 60 patients. We'll usually have 16 to 17 doctors. Uh, we'll place around 150 implants. We do a lot of bone grafting too, sinus lifting, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, fast forward to 2017, next year, we're going to be doing a, a program every month. And uh, it's sort of just taken on a new life of its own. Um, what excites me is these people who, who need this full arch uh, treatment can get into the implants now at no cost, right? We can do the surgery for them. We can do the bone grafting. We can place the Nobel BioCare implants for them. And then they can save that surgical fee and put it toward the restoration. And um, that's what I'm starting to see in my practice now. I, I'm, I'm, you know, for every implant I place, I'm probably restoring 50. Um, you know, and Howard, you know, I mean, there's surgery guys and there's restorative guys. Um, I, I've done a lot of implants. I've done over a couple hundred implants. I, when we do our programs, I'm a surgical instructor. I know what I'm doing. I, um, I like to help new doctors get started. But the bottom line is, in my practice, I'm mostly res restorations. And um, if you have homies out there who might be interested in getting into implants. Um, you know, the surgery is one side of it, but the restorations are the other. And uh, we should talk about maybe, you know, teaming up with some people, um, sending us patients. We can do the rest. We can do the, 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 rest, the implants um, and then we can get these people in to these full mouth reconstructions that they need but can't afford. Um, I mean, God knows the numbers are out there. I talked to hell. I'm talking to probably 75 people a month. And a lot of them need these full mouth restorations, but they've been blown away by Clear Choice. Um, they're out there. We just need to figure out a way to, to you know, get the get the service to them. Wow, that is an amazing program. So, so are you mostly talking to dentists? And I mean, was that a shout out to the your local homies in San Diego? No, no, no. I, listen, here's what happens. Okay, 60 patients per program, one program per month. We get 20 from San Diego. We get 20 from California, you know, north of San Diego. And we get another 20 who fly in for it. And then th of those patients who fly in, a lot of times they go back to their hometowns and there's nobody who can restore them. And, and if we could have um, a, a network where, you know, I could talk with, with uh, the doctors and, and they could understand what we do, um, they could feel comfortable with the surgery side of it, uh, maybe handling uh, suture removal here or there. And then if they could, they could restore these patients, I mean, you could do one to two full mouth reconstructions in their practice per month pretty easily. Um, we have the, the demand, the doctors are coming to us uh, with the demand, we just need to provide, um, you know, um, ideal patients, I say. I, I mean, I would like to provide these doctors with patients who are going to go home and get restored. Right now, probably a good third of our patients disappear. I never see them again. Um, I don't think that's uh, that's an ideal situation. So um, I'm looking to kind of, you know, kind of put out the word and see who, who's interested. Well, you know, Dental Town um, has 50 categories. And that's the difference between uh, Dental Town and all the social medias. Um, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, they all have the endless news feed. And whereas Dental Town, you go to Dental Town and we, it's organized in message board. So we have 50 categories. One is implants. And you should go under implantology and post a thread on that. Okay. I think that would be uh, huge. I, I mean, I think a lot of people would really get excited about that. I mean, I was surprised at how straightforward um, some of these restorations can be. Um, and, and I'd be willing to work with people, kind of show them what we're doing. You know, a lot of this stuff can be, um, uh, it's very amenable to, to an auxiliary, uh, especially an auxiliary with extended function. Um, they can place impression copings. They can, um, you know, take impressions. They can see, uh, you know, some of this uh, crown and bridge and they can help with the full art stuff. So, um, 
Yeah, I think there's a fantastic opportunity to help. You know, you probably know know the numbers better than I do. I can just tell you there's an entire population of people who need this service. Clear choice blows them out of the water. They go home depressed. Uh, they're, um, you know, they, they're too young to go into full dentures. They don't want to stick their dentures. They don't want to stick their teeth in a cup at night. You know, half the people who are edentulated get edentulated before the age of 44. These are young, beautiful women who just... Uh, they're just too young for this, and and um, you know we can't we can't solve everybody's problem, but man, we can solve um, a whole bunch of people's problems through this program that we have going. And I'd love to see where it would go. I mean, who knows? That is amazing. So, what kind of lessons have you learned from helping over three hundred doctors place their first dental implants? Well, uh, you know, so we've probably had 400 go through our program and, and a, a fourth of them come with a lot of dental knowledge, but, you know, the majority don't. So um, and you see a pattern. Yeah, I know you mentioned you talk a lot about patterns that you see. Well, it's predictable when you have a new doctor come in. Um, uh, you, we can almost sit back and just watch them go through the learning curve. And uh, I will tell you this. If anybody out there is thinking, oh, I'm not surgically oriented at all, I can't place an implant, uh, I would challenge you on that because if you can do uh, uh, you know, uh, an MOD onlay, you're more than qualified to place an implant. So there's a couple things that I would encourage uh, the new dentist to look at. Uh, number one, you know, <laughs> Don't don't do this without a CT scan. It's crazy. Um, you know, you wouldn't drive across town uh, without without being strapped in, without your seatbelt on. Uh, get a CT scan. With with a CT scan, uh, you're going to see um, enough information, and you'll get the confidence that you need to not worry about hitting anatomy or or angulation. Um, you'll know approximately how, how deep the implant needs to go. You'll know what size implant. Um, you'll know the density of the bone. So get a CT scan. Just get a CT scan. Which, uh, brand, which, brand, which brand? Uh, homies always, they always want me to hold your feet to the fire and say they want to know which one you bought. Yeah, I mean, we like, um, we like the iCat, but it, it's not... It doesn't have to be an ICAT. I mean, you can send your patient to an imaging center or, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe, I know they're expensive. I, why, I, why, I, I, I get why, that. Why but. did you buy the ICAT and not the iDog? <laughs> you know, because uh, my partner has an iCAT, so I got comfortable with that. Um, but once again, any machine out there will work. Just get get comfortable um, just knowing how to, how to treatment plan on it. And then, and then you're going to have so much confidence when you when you go to the next step. I, I would say, you know, um, you got to embrace the flap, guys. You know, this flapless stuff. Uh, that's that's an advanced technique. If if you learn uh, how to flap and and where to cut and where not to cut, and you you're looking at a piece of, of beautiful bone and it's right in front of you and you you know how deep you can go uh, you know if you have a stopper on your on your drill you know anybody can can place uh, the, the the correct angle of the osteotomy uh, in into a ridge that they can see but so you have to see it first you know you you know it's not like doing a MB2 where you're in there and you're blind I mean that's that takes skill but Placing implants in, in in adequate bone that you can see will lower your learning curve dramatically. Okay, you just said beautiful bone. That that means you're, you are third generation dentist, and you might have <laughs> not, not not many people call it beautiful bone. Right? Oh man, yeah, yeah. I, my partner and I sometimes when when we when we look at a CT scan and it's, it, I mean you know I I, I said this is. <laughs> This is a CT porn right here. It's just beautiful bone, nice, dense, hard bone, lots of it. Um, so I get excited about that. Well, you know what? That, yeah. that, that's neat because in Dental Town, there's a couple threads. Uh, there's a thread called uh, dental porn. And a lot of people <laughs> uh, don't realize they, they think porn is uh, about uh, nudity. But the definition of porn is um, it, it's very interesting how people don't realize that. Um, it's it's a beautiful sight, you know. The uh, what what do they say it's about the? It's uh, basically something that's um, beautiful. Uh, yeah, some, yeah, something that's aesthetic that creates an an emotional feeling. Um, it's not um, just smut. It actually means that it's something is. Uh, it comes from. Uh, but but anyway, it's uh, something beautiful. 
Um, but anyway, well, but, 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 yeah. I, but I already know what she's thinking. She's driving to work right now. I know how she thinks. I've seen her. I've been on dental town four hours a day since 1998. She's thinking, but I can just get a surgical guy and not lay a flap and just punch that hole right through the tissue. I don't want to lay a flap. I don't want to be a surgeon. I don't like blood and guts. Um, okay. So, so, Good. so address that. Okay. Well, um, you know, you know, as well as I do, surgery is not for everybody. And if I had to choose a camp, you know, I, I, I placed a lot of implants, but I, I liked, I do like the restorative side of it too. And, um, so maybe you're, maybe you're not a surgery guy. That's fine. Or a surgery gal. That's fine. I would challenge you to at least come and, you know, maybe sit in on one of our, our programs and you don't, you don't have to be a surgeon. You can come to just to watch. Um, we have some of our doctors will bring a patient with them. All right. The patient gets the implants. That patient goes back to the, with these doctors. The doctor restores them. Uh, that pays for the course. All right. So uh, it really shouldn't be, um, you know, that hard to um, to get compensated for your time while you're getting educated. Just learn the process. But I mean, how many pilots fly on autopilot without knowing how to turn off the autopilot and land that plane safely if something goes wrong? What if you have a, a guide and it's off or, um, you know, what if, um, you know, what if you you uh, what if there's an intrasurgical complication? You want to know. You want to know how to get yourself out of it. You know, it's like Invisalign. You mentioned Invisalign. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I do some Invisalign, but how often when that damn case is done, are you looking at it at a posterior open bite or something? And then you have to go place some brackets and close the bite and, and salvage the case. I mean, um, so it's hard to be overeducated. So, so before you, you, you make that decision or, or, um, you know, tell yourself, I can't do that. You know, check into it first, and because I, I bet you would come to be able to place the simple implants, um, uh, and you would enjoy it. Um, and certainly, you should be able to restore implants as well. I mean, that's lucrative and fun, and yeah. And there's there's that, that um, was a, that was a that was worth the whole podcast for me just for that analogy about you know um, a surgery guy being like an autopilot, but a real pilot has got to be able to turn off the autopilot and land the plane manually or lay a flap. That is so cool because I've had the big discussion. One of my best buddies is a pilot and my first cousin is a pilot. And um, a lot, you know, they, they've been doing cruise missiles for so many years that with, uh, you know, those airplane engines and the cruise missiles are perfect. They don't have any pilot error, uh, but they're never going to take the pilot out of the airplane because you got a $50 million piece of equipment up there with uh, 140 souls and they're not going to have <laughs> driverless airplanes no. when, when you got a $50 million aircraft and 140 live people up there. Yeah. They're always going to leave a live monkey. You might have – Uber might have driverless taxis someday, but you're not going to see uh, <laughs> driverless 747s. And, but but, yeah. but I, but I want to go back to that point again and ask it in a different way. Um you know, her problem is she just, uh, it's, you know, your self-limiting beliefs all live between your ears. So to yeah. come out of dental school and say, I hate uh, surgery, I hate wisdom teeth, I hate molar endo, the, you need to solve that problem. That's an attitude problem and just get over it. I mean, the th best thing about endo is they're coming in there begging you to do treatment because they're in pain. Whereas veneers, yeah. you got to be a salesman and try to sell them on bleaching, bonding veneers, but they're begging you to fix a toothache and um but 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 what but go back to that um the uh surgical guide because that was one of the most controversial threads on the on the implant dentistry deal to surgical guide or not um, and and uh, i'm uh, i'm talking about um yeah just talk about surgical guides because a lot of people do uh swear by him and a lot of people who have placed a thousand to ten thousand implants have never used one so how yeah. can you have this huge um, how, how do you have this very asymmetrical body of dentists where you got all these studs that have placed 5,000 plus, never use them, then all these kids that are millennials say you have to use them and I use them for every single case. Where, where's, the, where's the 50 shades of gray in the middle? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, honestly, I think it just depends on how you learn, how, how, uh, how, how you, you know, what your experience level is like. I've never used a guide. I mean, uh, and uh, you know, Howard, some of your other um, um, guests have talked about the old guys don't use them and, and the new guys kind of are. So I was taught by an old school guy 
And, um, you know, we do everything from single placement to full arch and a guy never crosses our minds. I, I don't know. I, I guess you'd have to talk to someone who does both. Well, I guess um, there's 50 ways to skin a cat, right? Yeah. And they, yeah. Can, and they but, can both do it correctly. Yeah, but it just seems like if if you have a CT scan, you kind of know where you want to go. You know how deep you can go. You got a scalpel in your hand. You load the patient up with some dexamethasone, a nice steroid, so they're not going to feel anything for a few days. You give them a little halcyon. You know where to cut. You know to reflect. You see this bone in front of you, and uh, and you make your your basic osteotomies based on measurements that you learn. And uh, you know this is all part of the course. You can be super super successful and never have to go to a guide. But I'm sure guide have their place i know guides have their place i don't want to say anything about guides because man the stuff that comes back from um some of the surgeons that i refer to beautiful beautiful work with guides um but sometimes you just want to you know remove a tooth and 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 place the implant and you know but, not but order I, the guide. I, i've seen a case where a single guide ruined a dentist's entire career <laughs> Remember that guy who hired a guy to go shoot a lion, and he led him to Cecil the lion. <laughs> that, 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 uh, yeah, that we were that, guides. That 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 <laughs> ended that guy ended his career. Um, that was that the guy who bought John Lennon's tooth. No, no, that's no different. Fact. That's a Canadian. Okay, um, who right. was the guy? Was it a uh, um, here? I'll type in Cecil the lion. Uh, Walter Palmer. No, the dentist from Minneapolis who killed Man. Cecil Lyon. That's uh, that's got to be the uh, worst guide that you've ever had <laughs> in, uh, in all of dentistry. Uh, yeah, but we'll call that a lion guide. Um, you you've written about the anesthesia eight ball and don't get behind it. What what do you mean? Yes, by the anesthesia yes, eight ball? gosh, okay. In general dentistry, you know, uh, most of our procedures we can get by with a couple carpules. All right, with implant dentistry and, and as well as extractions. Man, numb the hell out of your patient and get get them numb as hell to, when, before you get started. Um, whenever they start to have a twitch, numb them some more. Um, plenty of, of halcyon if that's what you want to use, but stay ahead of the anesthesia. What we see in our course is uh, patients, the doctors will come in, they'll numb. By the time they get the extractions done, they're starting to wear off, but by this time they flapped a little bit too much. Now it's too hard to go back and re-anesthetize before they have to shape the bone, place the implant. So uh, I would tell the new dentist, um, you know, give a little extra anesthetic, uh, anesthetic, use marking, use something that's going to last a while, but you need to numb the patient more so than you do with most of your um, general dentistry procedures. And that's something that, that we see time and time again. The, the, the new dentist um, gets behind the anesthesia curve and then they're fighting the case the whole, the whole rest of the time. So, so, so your go-to standard anesthesia on dental implant surgery is marking? Uh, usually, um, we, I, I personally like, like, uh, Articane or Septicane, um, in general dentistry, but we'll use it. Um, we usually like for a, a mandibular case, uh, two, two carpules of Lido and one of Marcane, same thing for the other side. And then, you know, you can, you can comfortably treat the patient and not have to fight the, uh, fight the patient as they start to feel things because they're numb as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk about, uh, uh, you also talk about atraumatic extractions and that you got to clean the hell out of the socket. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, can you place an implant in a site that has infection? Okay. Um, chronic infection, we treat, we clean the hell out of the socket though. We get in there, we scrape it out. Um, we'll place implants though in any, any socket that has chronic infection. If there's acute infection, we don't, we don't even bone graft those sites. Um, you make your money in implant dentistry with the extraction. I mean, that's what takes the time, the atraumatic extraction, because uh, you want to try and preserve as much of that, that bone as you can. Um, and uh, if, if you're uh, a little too aggressive at that, at that stage, um, it's going to complicate placing the implant. So you got to learn how to do extractions atraumatically. In 2017, um, we, we use the uh, piezo surgery units. Um, you know, we like the physics forceps, uh, we like peritomes, whatever it takes to atraumatically extract the tooth. You don't want to take a bunch of bone with your extractions. Um, no bueno. Man, I wish you'd write it, build an online CE course on uh, atraumatic extractions. We put up 400 online CE courses. The views are coming up on a million views. I mean, these millennials love it. Um, if they're on a smartphone, if they're on an iPhone, you can throw the iPhone um, um, 
it from your Dental Town app. You can throw it right up onto your Apple TV. I mean, Apple yeah. TV is only like 225 bucks. But you just said a lot of things that I wish you go back up. You said physics forceps. What else? Um, the uh, the piezo uh, surgery units that, that you know. Um, you know, those have special tips that can just work their way right down the PDL. Um, um, yeah, you know, sectioning teeth, um, whatever it takes to get the tooth out without bringing a lot of bone with it. So once once you have your extraction, you're about you're about 75 percent of the way home. Yeah. And why, why do you like the uh, physics forceps as opposed to your regular forceps? Well, uh, I mean, I don't think there's anything you know, magical about the physics forceps, but we have those in the program. Pe people like them. Um, yeah, so I can't say a whole lot about the physics forceps, but just atraumatically get the tooth out. Take your time. But you do like the piezo unit. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and those are expensive. So, I mean, I'm not saying you run out and buy one of those right off the bat, but, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, periotomes uh, as opposed to, um, you know, elevators and that, that, that kind of thing. What were, were physics forceps, were those invented by Carl Misch? You know, uh, golden, golden forceps. Um, I think Carl may have partnered with the guy who invented them. Um, Daddy. Yeah. But, but a lot of it's just, just keep uh, elevating and elevating and then yes. going yes. down the PDL and going yes. slow. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, another trick that a, uh, a dentist taught me a long time ago that I still use is, um, you know, hydraulic pressure. You you, you mm -hmm. couldn't lift the Empire State Building, but if you put it into a beaker of uh, water and shoved a number two pencil in the bottom of the beaker, it would lift up the Empire State Building for the volume of that pencil. And um, this old guy taught me this. It was so cool. He said, you know, when you start to elevate, you start to yeah. rupture all these ligaments and arteries and veins, and they start loading fluid into the area and he says sometimes if it doesn't budge or you're having a hard time just sit there and have him bite down a gauze say i need to let this soak for 10 minutes and then you go do a hygiene check go see the crown you come back and yeah. it is significantly yeah. have, have, yeah. you, have you ever noticed that in your group? Yeah, absolutely yeah you know one thing we notice especially a lot of, do of doctors who are in a corporate dentistry man they're fast they're like grease lightning. And in the implant industry, sometimes you have to slow down just a little bit. So that's another thing that we notice with the new the new doctor coming out of uh, general dentistry. Slow down, you know, take a breather. Do exactly like you said. Um, yeah, because that's an amazing technique. Just take a breather and sometimes those teeth will almost come out themselves. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so talk about meet Mr. Lindemann. Okay, yes. So... You know, most of these, well, not most, but a good percentage of these implants that come through our, our program every year, I end up restoring. And the number one problem that I see are these implants are placed right on that buckle plate. All right. And if you look at many CT scans, that damn tooth, especially in the maxillary anterior, it lives right on the buckle plate. And there's a little potato chip of bone that that is encased in that tooth and that bone there is getting blood from the periosteum it's getting blood from the pdl it's very happy but once that tooth goes that little potato chip of bone does not have the blood supply anymore and if you use that as a wall to try and get primary stability with your implant that bone goes away in about three weeks the tissue follows it it's a nightmare so we use a little burr called a lindemann it's a side cutting burr. And one of the things with the CT scan is you can look at the CT scan, you can see where that extraction socket is, and then you see all this beautiful bone apical to it, and we want to redirect that extraction socket. All right, and that extraction socket is lined with a hard cortical bone that won't let your drill just redirect. You need to go in there with a Lindemann and you need to break through that hard cortical bone on the palate and then redirect your osteotomy where you want it to go. If you don't have a Lindemann, um, your your complications are going to go through the roof. So that's one of the things that our, our doctors learn is when you look at these extraction sockets, you know, Immediate placement, I love immediate placement, but most of the time you gotta do a little bit with that socket in order to create enough space, buckle to your implant, and we 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 fill the gap, we fill everything. 
So you want a millimeter and a half, two millimeters of buccal bone if you want nice stable tissue and a nice stable implant. So the Lindemann is a side cutting burr. It normally doesn't come with most implant kits. You, you, you need to go buy one, but it changes everything. It's, a, it's magic. And where do you get the Lindemann burr at? You can order it. Um, uh, you can go, I think you just order it from any any um, dental supply guy. I know. Uh, I know. Salvin Dental Specialties carries it. Salvin definitely carries it. Yeah. Do you, do you yeah. Use don't that? Do you, go ahead. What? I was gonna say, don't don't do implants without a Lindemann. So do you uh, do you buy many surgical supplies from uh, um, Salvin Dental Specialties? Absolutely. Salvin's one of our sponsors. Yeah. So uh, they're at every one of our programs. He's a. I, I've noticed all the hardcore implant junkies use use uh, Salvin Dental Specialties. Have you ever yeah. noticed that? Uh, I, I know all the junkies I come in contact with. Yeah, do, yeah. He's, and he's, he's a hell of a guy too. Yeah, he's got a cult following um, with um, with implantologists. Well, why why do you think that is? It, was he was he the, uh, there in the beginning with everybody? I mean, he's been around forever, right? Well, I'm sure he doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I get to meet all the initiating guys riding uh, uh, Louis Alfarage's coattails, and I had dinner with, um, with is it Bob Salvin? Yeah. Yeah, super generous, nice guy. Just uh, He told us his story. He used to drive around, pack up his family, and go to these different meetings, and um, just basically grew a business from the ground up. Yeah, and he's um, he's always at all the uh, surgery courses. Like he's a uh, uh, sponsor of yours. Uh, I um, he, he's he's uh, he's on the road. He's always touring, and I, I always um, think about that when um, I my my favorite show of the year is always the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's usually in like eight uh, late April, and uh, you know they only let about six or seven guys in there each year. Uh, I just had the honor to uh, lecture there for Patterson in Cleveland, where they have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I love the acceptance speeches the most because because these guys, you know, are successful in music as opposed to dentistry, um, or are getting into the Hall of Fame for football, uh, which is also in Ohio. And uh, the one thing uh, I always think it's so amazing is when those guys are getting inducted to Hall of Fame. Not only are they still old. They're still touring. I mean, when the, the week of that cheap trick got accepted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they had done like a, three countries. They were in like Japan, Taiwan, somewhere in America. And I thought, man, these guys are still hustling all yeah. the way to the end. And yeah. I, I you know, that. and I mean, like, 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 I mean, I guess the Stones are putting out a new album. Yeah. It's I mean, that's who they are. Their, it's always right? their final tour. I think I've seen them on yeah. their final tour three times. Yeah, yeah, it's not for the money anymore. It's who they are. That's what they do. But you know the uh, um, speaking of that, the Rolling Stones. You know who uh, the the uh, most amazing uh, rock and roll Hall of Famer that I ever met in my life or ever saw in my life. Uh, that this uh, this lady gets uh, to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and, and she makes it, and nobody even had heard of her. And I asked one of my friends, "Who is that?" And no one really even knew. What it turns out, she made a movie. Did you see that Ten Feet from Stardom? No. Uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame figured out that there were the 80-20 rule. The, all through the 70s, the mega stars like Mick Jagger, you just talked about the Rolling Stones, um, they found the most talented backup singers from these uh, gospel singing uh, churches all throughout the South, and they would just let them go. And most people didn't like that. They wrote sheet music, and they told them to read the sheet and quit overpowering the lead singer, whereas... Um, whereas, you know, Mick Jagger, when this lady started to just rip, he would like take 10 steps back and just let her, let her have it. Um, David Bowie said that the high self-esteem, uh, singers would know you're getting outsung by this lady. So <laughs> shut up. And, and, and they, and that movie, 10 feet from stardom, they take some of David Bowie's songs and they take her out of it and he's yeah. just singing it and it's dull and flat. Then you yeah. add in this amazing lady, and this lady had showed up on, on so many of the most amazing albums. They just said this, this was a big part of the success. And now let's go to dentistry. They won't even take their dental assistant with them to the implant course. You know, I mean, they, yeah. they, they don't even train their dental assistant. They won't let their hygienist diagnose when they're in there for an hour, even though, you know, you're not going to go in there and do a filling just because she said so. You're going to co-diagnose and, and check. But, man, having yeah. the greatest backup 
uh, assistant in the world is a big reason why the Stones and on that last Stones concert they had that um, they they had another backup singer I forgot her name I don't know so she's drop dead gorgeous but I mean she she was ten times better singer than Mick Jagger <laughs> I know yeah you know just get it done it, 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 and you know share the share the uh, share the the wealth uh, share the share the glory uh, yeah absolutely I mean. And Bob, Sal and Bob Salvin, that, that's another thing I was talking about, the, the cheap trick. I mean, he's been on tour at all these surgical implant training seminars for as long as I've ever been going to him for 30 years. Yeah. And he has met and had dinner with everyone who's anyone in that day. And he knows so much because he's seen them all. And he, yeah. he, he's not a dentist and he can sit there at dinner and probably teach you more about implant dentistry than anyone. I know yeah. you also use Nova BioCare. Talk about that. I know my homies. She said her saying, well, that's the expensive one. Shouldn't I get a, should I get a cheap one? I mean, you guys could have got anyone. Why, why did you use no BioCare? Oh, I, I mean, um, you may piss a couple of people off. We think Novo BioCare is the king. And when they came knocking, you know, absolutely. We're, uh, we were just honored to, to have them sponsor our program. Uh, Louis Alfarage was with Nobel way back in the beginning. And, um, uh, he's uh, very well connected with them. Um, I, you know, I've restored a lot of implants. Nobel is is just such a treat to restore. Um, the the you know, depending on what cases you're doing, if you're doing a lot of immediate load, the you know the Nobel Active is um, you know second second to none for initial stability. We also do the Nobel Replace. Um, that's another great implant. Um, they um, happen to have the same internal connection. So um, if somebody was going to ask. Uh, ask me, I would say, you know, I, I, I get the luxury of restoring these Rolls Royce of implants every day. But um, then again, you know, we've used other implants in the past too, and, and implants integrate. I think really where it comes down to um, uh, separating the men from the boys when it comes to implants is just your restorative options and the precision of the abutments. And when you're doing a full mouth reconstruction, um, I know there's a lot of other implants out there, but boy, the Nobel products uh, just work. You know, they just work. And what's the difference in your mind when you use a Nobel Active versus a Nobel Replace? Well, a couple things. Um, you know, the Nobel Replace is tapered. The Nobel Active is a little more parallel. Um, the uh, th th they both have their their places. Um, the uh, the initial stability is where you really get your money's worth when it comes to the Noble Active. As, you know, immediate load, the immediate load cases. Well, it's interesting. Another uh, observation I've made uh, on these implants over 30 years that um, everyone I know that uses Nobel, one of the um, we were talking about um, Bob Sullivan, you know, been on the road doing this forever. Um, it's, it's because of their rep. And they, they, they have had this rep who's been in the business such a long time. And it just seems like if you don't have that human in your backyard, if you don't have that connection, whether she's fixing you up to have lunch or drinks after work with other uh, implantologists, but it just seems like the only ones who get it done and get to that critical mass of one implant per week. If you're not doing an implant once a week, I don't think you're really ever going to get fast predictive, profitable. It's never going to get faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, and profitable. Same thing with Invisalign or sleep apnea. If you're not doing a case once a yeah. week, you just never get there. And it seems right. like everybody I know that does more than one a week, 50 implants a year, they have a tight relationship with a human in their in their city, their town, their county. And uh, that, that's a big part of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you see a lot of different implants they integrate but uh it's that when it comes to restoring that's really where some of these uh uh giants in the industry really stand out yeah uh, so what do you what do you mean when you talk about hold the handpiece like an implantologist and not a general dentist <laughs> oh good okay uh, this is something we see all the time you know in in, in general dentistry we use our wrist a lot right we're doing we're prepping in implant dentistry that wrist has to be frozen and you you bend at the elbow. You don't you don't bend the wrist. So that's something that um, uh, will keep your implants parallel, straight up and down. If you if you start bending the wrist, uh, no bueno. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, whether you have to use drill extensions or come from the side if you're in the posterior mandible, keep that wrist frozen and bend from the elbow, and that's going to keep your implants straight up and down. So okay, so, so are you doing this, about. Do, you, do you place your implants and extractions standing up or sitting down? I'm a general dentist. I sit down. Yeah, everything's sitting down. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Farage, he doesn't use a mirror. He doesn't know how to look through a mirror anymore. He's, he's lost that ability. Everything he does uh, is he teaches everybody to sit down. And if you have to put the patient on their head to treat the maxilla, you do. You get comfortable. You sit down. You flap where you see what's going on. He talks a lot about, you know, enjoying the surgery, being comfortable. Um, sit down. Absolutely. Yeah. I can, I can tell you the creepiest story in the world that relates <laughs> to this. So we know this um, this guy who um, was too old and uh, had had uh, prostate cancer and he's in his 90s and no one was going to work on him. And he had to go around um, because, you know, the anesthesia, the age, he just, um, they just, they just said, we're not going to do this. He finally found a guy that would do the prostate surgery. And guess what that guy did to him? <laughs> he hung him up by his feet. He said, he said the, the bleeding will be out of control, so I went, the blood, I went the gravity to take the majority of blood down. But yeah. was, when you're hanging by your feet and I'm standing there, the blood's below, I have perfect vision, and everybody who won't do this procedure has him laying horizontal on a bed. And when he, and when he first decided he was going to hang these patients by their ankles, and, and you you have that um what that board what what's that that low, some people have lower back pain where they strap in their ankles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back. That's what he's uh -huh. doing. That's okay. what he's doing. And and you Makes you sense. said you said when you're working on the maxilla, put their head in your lap and look right down at it. I mean these these ankle chairs that your buddy has for helping the lower back. There are there are oncologist surgeons who use that just because they the surgery comes first. And patient position uh, is secondary. Yes. And, Amen. And, and he hangs them upside down by their feet in one of those uh, uh, special deals. And everybody yeah. thought he was nuts when he started doing that. And now he's the only guy that will do these most advanced cases. And it's because of patient position. Yeah, and you can see, I mean, think about how, how often as general dentists are we standing on our heads, looking up into the patients. I mean, come on, you know, I mean, get to a position where you're comfortable, get to where you can see everything, and and you're going to have a good time doing surgeries, and you're going to be successful. You're going to, you, you, you can predict what's going to happen, you can predict your outcomes, and you don't go home with a major backache. You know, I'm kind of a hybrid because um, when I was in the high school in 1980, one of my mentor uh, dentists who I adored was uh, Dr. Peltzer on West Side of Wichita, and he did all of his dentistry stand up. And yeah. then there were a lot of dentists who were starting to sit down, and I have this hybrid deal where I have to stand for all implants and surgeries, and then yeah. I sit down for everything else. But I am wicked at um, leaning them back and putting their head in my lap at the, because when I learned from Crown and Bridge people that they could tell on these full mouth reconstructions that the dentist was right-handed or left-handed, they said they could tell you every time, you know, they can tell the angle that you're so, right. you know, so 12 o'clock straight down in your lap, uh, yeah. you know, you gotta, you gotta be able to prep that thing. So the lab man can't tell you if you're a righty or a lefty. Yeah. Yeah. And we're constantly, um, you know, acquiescing to it. I mean, we got to we got to make our patients comfortable. But at the same time, you know, general dentists, we're constantly not leaning them back far enough. We're doing whatever it takes to get the procedure done, but we're not in ideal positions. And implant dentistry, you know, you know hold your breath for a little bit. We're, this is going to take a couple of minutes, but I'm going to stand you in a position that I can see and I can get the job done right. That's a huge, huge part of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, when you talk about when the extraction's done, you're you're almost home. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Because that that's the big part, the atraumatic extraction, all that. And then when you get done with that, place the implants easy. But God, after you place that implant, it seems like the longest part of the entire procedure is suturing. Uh, what what are yeah. your thoughts on suturing? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've pulled a tooth in thirty seconds and then spent ten minutes on the suture. <laughs> yeah. Um. 
Well, and I see a lot of sutures a week and a half later when they walk into my office and a full arch is unraveled and the tissues flapped open and there's bacon and, and, uh, and you know, eggs down stuck in there and we have to get in there and clean everything out and re-suture. So, um, that, that's suturing, not from the dentist though. That's because that patient, after they were done, went and got on a surfboard and ate probably. a wave. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, a lot of times they'll have lower <laughs> anteriors. You know, how, and how, many, eat, how many waves have you eaten in your life? Oh, <laughs> uh, we get lots of nasal flushes in that sport. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Uh, but what's, what's but yeah, your advice on suturing. I love horizontal mattress sutures. Um, you know, and place uh, one in the anterior mandible, a couple on the side. If you want to do your uh, continuous interlocking, is good. Um, sometimes if you take that that loop and you twist it twice and you do a double interlocking or you go ahead and do single interrupted, um, but it's such an important part of the procedure. And usually by the time you get there, like you said, you know, you may be tired and you may be thinking, hey, this is just a formality, but you know, um, getting that case uh, closed up properly um, is huge for the long-term success. So we, uh, we teach that as well. We you know, show you some basic techniques that anybody can do and um, and then th that guarantees you're going to have a uh, high probability of success. I saw yeah. the greatest suture job in my entire life. Somebody posted it uh, where they had a big cut on their arm and whoever sutured the incision perfectly spelled out ha 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 ha. I mean, it was like <laughs> H-A, 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 H-A. I mean, I don't know if they did it on purpose or that just looked like, but it looks like, yeah. it looks like they absolutely did on purpose. But I thought it was just uh, really uh, artistic the way it was done. Um, so, so what, go ahead. I, I was going to say real quickly, uh, my mom just had an open heart surgery. She had two open heart surgeries in within 10 days. We were on Lake Powell and she had an aneurysm go. We had to life light her out and they cracked her open and uh, did the, did a, a a aortic replacement then they had to go back in a couple days later and, and replace some valves anyways they use surgical uh super glue on our chest they used to put these big staples in and now they're using super glue and so hey isobutyl cyanoacrylate yeah and, and what sets it up is the hydrogen ion so when you use super glue the like a millionth of a second it touches free hydrogen ion it totally sets and yeah. I, I uh, have been reading where they use it in uh, tumors too, where they're going to go and remove a tumor, but they don't have really good boundaries or borders. So what they do is they put in a, can a uh, cannula through the artery to the main artery that's feeding this tumor, and they put out a glob of superglue to block the main one. And it'll take like 24 hours for that tumor to make another small artery be the main one again to build it from a, you know, a two-lane road back to an interstate. And in that 24-hour shock, then when they go in and do the surgery, the surgeons say they have more defined borders and can get it all. And uh, just, but, but yeah, super glue is amazing. amazing. But no one will FDA approve it because no one's going to go through the multi-million dollar FDA process for something you can buy at Walgreens for a dollar. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a that's a weird quirk in healthcare. How do you how do you spend millions of dollars in something? Remember, I remember when bleaching came out. Remember when bleaching came out? It was by Omni, Omni out of uh, Arkansas. Yeah, I think it was Arkansas, and it was yeah. nine nine hundred dollars for six bottles. And then everybody was like, "But wait a minute, we can just go to Walgreens and buy the uh, what was that canker sore medication?" Uh, uh like Zylac or yeah, yeah. They, I mean, you something. had you had a substitute. At Walgreens, where you could fill that bottle back up uh, for under twenty bucks, so why were you paying nine hundred dollars for for uh, for six? I thought that was yeah. uh, that was kind of interesting. I want to talk about something personal, and you don't have to talk about it if you don't want. But you um you married a dentist, and so you got two dentists. So how do you nav? And now you're gonna have a daughter that's a dentist. My God, how do you navigate? Your dad's a dentist, your grandpa's a dentist, your wife's a dentist, she's fourth generation dentist, now Alexis is going to become a dentist. How do you balance uh, work to play? Do you, do you, uh, how does how does that, what advice would you give? Because how long have you been married? We, uh, let's see, married in 95. My God. 22? <laughs> 22 years. So right now, yeah. um, you know, a lot of kids are listening to this at school or they're commuting to work and they're yeah. dating their lover and they're both dentists. What advice would you give them 22 years later about um, making it, uh, it work in dentistry and family? 
Good. Yeah. Great question. I, you know, I, I mean, I think the, the, the family has to come first. I mean, you know, dentistry is fun and, and you want to be successful. Um, but you got to be able to turn it off and just have fun and relax and, and have a beer. And, um, and, you know, um, like my wife and I, you know, when we get home, we may talk dentistry for about the first five minutes, but then there's no more dentistry. We're going to crack a bottle of wine. We're going to go watch, uh, you know, some mindless show together. Uh, you know, uh, we like to watch Deadliest Catch because we, we, we look at those guys on those boats in 30 foot seas and they're freezing their ass off. And we say, no matter how bad dentistry gets, you know, it's never this bad. Um, we like to watch, uh, you know, some of those uh, reality shows, Naked and Afraid. It's like, no matter how bad dentistry gets, at least we're clothed and at least we're not getting eaten alive by bugs. Anyways, find something you like to do together. And, and and lighten up. I mean, my God, you know, sometimes we're so motivated to try and reach that million dollar point. Then we want to reach the 1.5. Then we want to reach the 2 million point. And, um, uh, you know, the, the incremental increases in income really don't affect your life that much. Uh, just be be friends and, and find things you like to do together and uh, lighten up. Just freaking lighten up. Don't go in debt. My God, I've heard you talk about this a hundred times. Uh, you know, I feel the same way. There's enough stress as there is. You don't need to have the stress of having to close a case because you know you got to make your nut that month. You know, uh, save money, spend less than you make, drive a used car. Um, um, you know, uh, you know, try to pay your house off. I mean, I always think of it. Look, if shit hits the fan, at least I got a house. And I can probably survive on, you know, 3000 a month if I had to. And, and you just don't have that extra strain of having to make your, your financial nut every day. And, and like you say, what does it come down to a lot of times? Money, sex, and, 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 and drugs. Is that, am, I, am I quoting you? <laughs> I think, I think right. sex and drugs have been quoted <laughs> by a million people. <laughs> yeah, but so... Um, yeah, and give yourself, you know, give each other margin. I mean, you know, sometimes you're going to fly off the handle a little bit. Forgive, forget, move on. Um, don't hold grudges. Um, you know, after the fight, man, hopefully you're going to come back stronger than before. Um, don't let the business, the dentistry, uh, you know, get into that relationship because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, our dentistry is going to end up in a coffin one day, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, but 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 the people we interact with, I mean, those are, you know, if if you believe in an afterlife, that's the only thing that's eternal people, their their souls go on. But uh, so invest in people, uh, you know, I hear you talk about it all the time, too. You know, I, I talk to these people who, who are ready to go to a full mouth, full mouth situation. And they want to first of all, they want to tell you about. Uh, you know, why their teeth are jacked up. And you got to listen. You got to listen. Let them tell you their story. Um, but treat the human being first. And then after they, they trust you and they know that you care about them, then you can do whatever you want with them as far as leading them down the, the, the dentistry path. But as far as your relationship goes, at least especially your, your, your wife, you know, the pressures that come with running a practice are, are great. Um, but try and leave it at the office and come home and just relax and have fun. Well, you know, oral health is secondary to mental health. And most of the main reason people are only trying to save their teeth and their smile is for their mental health. And, and they need, I believe it. They need oral health just because they're trying to get mental health. And there's no worse emergency in the world than when a woman loses her front tooth. Oh, right? my God. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean it, the, her whole world stops. All she wants mm -hmm. is, is her mind to be repaired. Um, so I want to continue on. Um, so both of you, is your wife's da dad a dentist? Is your father-in-law or mother-in-law a dentist? Father. Father. father and your dad's a dentist. Yes. So did you and your sweetie go work with one of them at first? or? Well, so, uh, no, my dad wouldn't let me into the practice until I knew what I was doing. So um, she went to work uh, for another office. I joined the public health service and got stationed uh, in a uh, federal prison in downtown San Diego. So that was kind of cool for a couple years. Uh, learned how to shoot firearms and learned a little self-defense and uh, got to, you know, treat some uh, 
interesting people. And then we went for loan repayment for four years up to northern uh, central California. And we worked in a migrant health center for four years, did loan repayment, got our loans under control, uh, did a lot of extractions, a lot of endo, um, just got, you know, fast. And then when we came back um, six years later, then we kind of started slowly integrating into uh, into my dad's practice. Then we bought him out a few years later. And um, and so here we are now. So um, so then your dad, being a successful dentist, decided he wasn't going to pay for your college, so you had student loans in. Yeah, absolutely, student loans, man. And when I look at that diploma on the wall, I want to kiss it because I busted my ass for that thing. So did you do the same thing to Alexis? We're going to. <laughs> you're going you're to make her pay for it? Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that, yeah, that's I mean, we're, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're paying her undergrad. But, you know, we're, she's going to pay for her, her, her graduate school. So you paid undergrad, and she's going to pay graduate school. Yeah, I mean, every economist that ever won a Nobel Prize talks about incentives matter. And you want people to have skin in the game. And, I mean, look at the difference to when you go to a dental seminar, the owner dentist's behavior versus the associate dentist. You know, the, associate, the, the owner's taking five pages of notes, and the associate dentist is uh, surfing Facebook the whole time. And right. when, when, when human beings have skin in the game, it changes their behavior. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great motivator. So I want, I want to go back to your father, though. And any lessons learned? A lot, a lot of millennials, they're uh, posting on Dental Town. They're stressed because they're going to get out of school and dad wants them to come work for them. And, and they just feel like, you know, what is it like having a business partner who's also your dad? I mean, it's, yeah. you're mixing family yeah. and business. And, and would you say there's more quotes saying don't mix family and business or more quotes say, no, that's a really good idea? <laughs> I think I think if it works, it's beautiful. If it works, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. If it doesn't work, it can be uh, the worst scenario possible. So, I, uh, you know, my dad was uh, probably 55% personality and human, you know, people, people. And he was uh, 45% dentist. Uh, so he was really easy to work with. Uh, he, he wasn't real. Um, he wasn't a taskmaster or anything. Uh, he just did bread and butter dentistry. He just loved, love, love people. I think that's a different scenario than if you walk into somebody who's uh, God's gift to um, Crown and Bridge and is uh, you know whipping out his uh, 4x lo- uh, loops to, to look at your prep and you ne- nothing's ever good enough. I mean, come on, you know? Well, yeah, nothing's ever good enough until they switch from the, when it was the lab man making it. Nothing was ever good enough. But yeah. then when they buy chair side milling and they start making it themselves, uh, they, they loosen up real quick. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they see chair side milling crowns that they would have never accepted from their kind of bridge guy. And when you say that, my, my hate mail flies off the charts, but I don't care. It's dentistry uncensored. It just is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm still, I'm still, uh, you know, uh, double arch with heavy body, light body. And, you know, I get that impression going and I walk away. My, my, my RDAs take it out, make the temp. Um, I guess I'm still in the stone age, but I don't see anything changing in my practice. Well, how, how old are you? 52. 52, do, are you looking at oral scanners? I mean, are you thinking? Or are you still going to stay old school? I mean, I mean, my, my I, I looked at my car. My, my Lexus uh, turned 160,000 miles a day. And, and, and I've got to tell you that these millennials, they don't realize they get out of school and they go buy an expensive Beamer and a too big of a house. Uh, man. And then that makes them have to eat out more. Then all yeah. that psyche makes them have to take vacations that are in Maui instead of going to the lake up the street with a trailer you pull behind the car that you're yeah. on the uh, don't do it it's I not know. worth it i know they just they, they because when they buy the beamer they feel good for about a minute <laughs> exactly and yeah. then their diarrhea switches from solid to, <laughs> to uh, blood and they um they don't realize it's so yeah uh, it's a great but you but, know, but, but 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 same thing goes to oral scanner because you got a, a lot of young kids listening to you right now and say right now i'm taking a 17 dollar 3m sb emperor gum impression and send it to the lab and now people are saying don't send it to the lab buy a hundred fifty thousand dollar chair site miller or buy some thirty thousand seventeen thousand dollar true definition scanner and sign up for a two hundred dollar a month uh, maintenance program and update program i mean so so how is your walnut brain going to wrap around switching from a cheap vinyl polysiloxane to a digital scanner 
Um, I mean, you know, the, the one benefit that I see to an oral scanner is if you are doing, getting back to implants again, if you're doing a lot of implants, trying to capture an accurate impression uh, so you can get this passive fit bar or, or, or substructure, that is a pain in the ass. That is very difficult to do. And there's this new scanner uh, lab of uh, across the street has purchased it. It's called a PIC, a PIC, it's out of Spain. And this thing can go in and this can scan a full arch of implants and give you a bar with passive fit that is amazing. I, I don't know where they are on the FDA approval list over here yet, but they're using it in Europe. And um, we've um, we've experimented with it a little bit. So yeah, I can see you know um, pain for a scanner for that purpose, but that's about it in my book. I may I I, I may be you know changing my mind in the future, but not as of today. Huh? And it's called PIC P I C. Yeah, they put these little scanning things into the implants that look like a golf flag with a domino on it. And these dominoes have different white spots and the scanner can triangulate on these different flags and give you this kick butt impression. Pickdental.com, CAD yeah. quality control out of Spain, huh? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that impression is unbelievable. So it sounds like you're going to stay with um, somebody across the street has one from you, so you're going to send send out your uh, imp impressions? Yeah, yeah, I think they're about thirty-five k. If you're doing a bunch of this stuff, then it might be might be worth it. But he'll he'll come to my office and take the impression for around four hundred bucks. Oh, he'll come to your office. Interesting, interesting, yeah. interesting. That's uh four hundred bucks to take the impression. So th this is just going to be on a, on a full arch implants. Full arch, yeah. But it will it'll eliminate all these uh, return appointments for for indexing and, and soldering and all this other stuff that goes on so it really really helps to uh, simplify it yeah so I'll uh, I retreat my guest um, so yeah they're at pick dental PIC dental provides the world's most precise impression technology guaranteeing the passive fit over the patient's implant out of Madrid Spain I think I'd rather go hear about this in Madrid Spain I don't think I think that would be uh, the best thing <laughs> God, I love yeah. Madrid and Barcelona you know and you know what you were talking about earlier well San Diego reminds me a lot of Barcelona and a lot of Spain um, I mean it re really does um, what, what, what's that um what, what's that big mission in the San Diego mission what's what's that called um yeah um Oh, uh, God, I lived here my whole life. I should know this. What was all the I know birds? what you're talking about. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Um, San Juan Capistrano, where yeah. the swallows return. Yeah. Okay, that's a little north of us. But 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 the thing about Spain, though, is um, they're just so much more laid back than anybody in America, Japan, or Germany. I mean, it seems like the dentists in Germany and Korea and Japan and America are just, they're just such, so intense. And then you go to Spain. And they're just so well rounded. They're just so laid back. They just, they just have a better attitude, a better work life deal. They don't want to work as hard as Germany or Sweden or Switzerland. Yeah. They really enjoy a bottle of wine and being from Spain. And, yeah, uh, I, and you really learn a lot from going around the world and realizing that you know when you when you spend your whole life in one tribe and drink all their purple Kool Aid, you really don't know what's really yeah. what and what's really just your tribe. And you start seeing these dental tribes from around the world, and there's a lot of tribes that are a lot happier than dentists in America, Germany, and Japan, yeah. and Korea, and most of them live in Spain. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Oh my God. And you know, you know, Howard, along along those lines, when you you know this uh, this trying to get the passive fit for for these bars, uh, another system I'm looking at is the um, um, the Denka Four. You know, Denka they do the digital dentures. Yeah. Well, they also now they have a, a full arch uh, implant restored solution where they use these interesting abutments that are segmented. So it's not a solid bar. You have these little T bars and then you you screw a superstructure over it. It can be PMMA or it can be zirconia. And uh, I'm doing some cases with these guys. And man, I mean, that can cut your full arch restoration down to uh, if you don't count the stage two surgery where you put the healing abutments in in three visits. These people can be going home with a final zirconia solution. 
So uh, interesting. Now, what do, what is that? Um, Denka. That's D E N C A. Yeah. Yeah. What what, what Denka, is your website? Denka.com. Denka. Dot com. Yeah, and you know they're uh, like uh, you know full dentures and two visits. Everything's CAD CAM. Yeah, Denka.com, high quality value for money solutions that enhance production performance. No, that's not it. That's software deal. What what did you find it at, Brian? Denka.com. That's Denka. D E N T C A. D E N T C A. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, dentures. Yeah, so we're 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 doing some full implant uh, supported restoration with with their system. It's slick. And uh, introducing the new interactive impression manual, Denka provides high quality, one hundred percent accurate dentures using award winning computer aided design and computer aided manufacturing with state of the art three D printing technology. Wow. So now you're using. So how does it work with them? Are they? Uh, what, where are they located at? Uh, they're up in Irvine, I think, uh, just north of us. But if you look at the Denka Four, that's the that's the full arch implant. Yes. Yeah. Take take a look at that. I'm excited about that. Uh, it's. And they are it's, at Dent Kane or Dent Dentka Inc. So at Dent. D E N T C A Dentka Inc. dot um, for Twitter. So I like to retweet my uh, my last guest uh, what they're doing, so my homies can find it easier because they're commuting to work and it really gets difficult uh, changing lanes and tweeting and texting. Um, yeah. So what website do you want them to go to to learn more about you? Is that would you have them go to Implant Education or? Yeah, well, they go to implanteducation.net if they're interested in coming to one of our programs, and they can be there as a, as a surgeon, or they can go there just to observe. It's, it's, it's half price if you want to go observe. If you want to bring a patient along, uh, you know, this patient can be um, surgically treated, then you can take the patient home and restore, help pay for the cost. Um, Anybody who's interested in restoring full arches, um, you know, I'm, I'm, my office is open to somebody if they want to come and, and see what we're doing. But I, I think as a, as a profession, we should look and see how we're going to take care of these um, millions of people who, who, who are being edentulated young and are too young for dentures. And uh, if we can get some of these full arch solutions um, going, we're, we're going to change lives and we're going to be profitable. I mean, it's, there's, it's a win-win. You can go to uh, our implant page if you want to learn about our program, free dentalimplants.org. Dentalimplants.org. Yeah. You also, was it also your site, dentist-san-diego.com? Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. just for, but you also have hearstdental.com? Yeah, hearst, hearstdentalcare.com. So do you have two websites for search engine optimization, or why, why, why do you have more than one website for your... Uh, you and your wife's dental office. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. The guy we hired to do our our, our implant page thought we'd get more uh, clicks if we had San Diego in there and stuff. So, so, right. so but HearstDentalCare.com is usually what we tell people to go to, and then it clicks onto that. Well, I'll tell you what's uh, really amazing is we put these podcasts on um, YouTube for the video and Facebook for the video and um, and Dental Town for the video, but it's sound only on iTunes. Uh, but I've had several uh, impl guys like you where I podcast on implants, and they've gotten patients from him. I mean, just right, just Chris Winterholler. I mean, he, I mean, he loves me. He said, "God, it wasn't even a week after this video went live, and I already got a complete all on four upper and lower arch just from driving over to your house and doing a video." And I've had nice. several of these dentists because the consumer is getting more sophisticated. And they start yeah. doing these search engine optimizations, and they they get to hear you and hear you talk and and uh, all that kind of stuff, and it, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, so uh, you might even want to put this video on your website. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah. Call, ask ask Chris Winterholler about it, and then a bunch a bunch of the dentists. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, my gosh, uh, I can't believe we've already gone over an hour and thirteen minutes. Uh, we went uh, we went way over. I just want to tell you seriously, I, I think what you're doing is so amazing. 
I think these kids come out of school $350,000 in debt, and they might walk out of school and say they hate molar endo and are afraid of implants. But, you know, when you get $350,000 committed into a profession, you kind of got to learn how to do it. And yeah. I say the thing about orthodontics and implants is the PPO monster isn't setting the fee. Uh, the NHS isn't setting the fee in the UK. I mean, the, I mean, a lot of these uh, major, most advanced civilizations on Earth in Tokyo and Paris and London, the government's only given them $100 for a molar endo. So when you turn the podcast off, they say, yeah, I can't do the molar endo for 100 but I'll extract the tooth and place a $1,500 implant so I can pay my overhead. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that starts, and that's what makes me scared about government uh, socialized medicine because I, I don't know anything about that, but I know dentistry, and I, I see how insurance reimbursement really changes treatment planning. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you got one of the it best is. hospitals in America in your backyard, Scripps, right? Yeah, absolutely. Is that is that the most famous one in uh, California? Is that where the I would say so. Yeah, at least in San Diego. Well, I mean, who would be better than that in all of California? Uh, it's a good question. Like uh, L.A. has like what Cedar Sinai is that? Well, I know people from Scripps. I mean, I've read like thirty percent of the patients in Scripps aren't even from the United States. I believe it. I mean, the the just the square footage of their facilities is is amazing up there. It's right in La Jolla. You know, you're you're almost looking over uh, the, over the the cliffs there, and um, it's beautiful. Um, I, I, if I was a surgeon, I'd want to live here. Yeah, um, so I, uh, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't mean, surprise that, me. That, that, that is a worldwide brand. I mean, there's dentists have heard of that in in Cambodia. Um, I I was afraid of getting that laser keratotomy. Because all my ophthalmology patients in the 80s saying, I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't do it, you know. And, but they kept getting it bigger and bigger, and they went from a two, you know, they just kept permanent. And finally, when my first ophthalmologist um, um, got it done on himself, I said, okay, now it's gone from bleeding edge to leading edge. And I went to Cahill and Sutton mainly because people had flown to have him do the surgery from like 50 different countries. And you walk in his waiting room, and he has this global map, and he has pens where all of his patients are from. And the guy says, yeah, not not even half of them are from F the Phoenix area. And 30% wow. of them had to take an international flight to get here. And I said, okay, you're doing my eyes. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. so that's amazing. Beautiful. So, uh, well, hey, thank you for all that you do for dentistry. Thank you for sharing an hour of your precious life to come on the show. And uh, talk about uh, dentistry and being married to a dentist, being son of a dentist, and having a dentist father-in-law and a daughter dentist. I think you're an amazing man. I sure really enjoy uh, talking to you today. Thank you, Howard. And, and everything that you do for our profession, um, man, just words words can't, can't express it. Thank you so much. All yeah. Right. All right, buddy. And uh, San Diego has got to be uh, – God, I love that town. Mainly because in Arizona, when it's 118, it's usually only 80 degrees there. Yeah. I mean, my God, that is such a difference. And you don't realize how hot it is in Phoenix until you come back from San Diego. And the first three days are horrible because you're just felt <laughs> beaten by the heat. Um, yeah. Uh, the best thing to do is just uh, not go to San Diego and you're not aware of how hot it is. <laughs> but, man, I, I can't tell you how many times I've come back from San Diego. Oh, last final question. Yes, last sir. Last final question. Demographics matter. What would you say? You got five dental schools. No, six dental schools in L.A. Uh, I mean, six dental schools in California. What would you say to a senior in dental school, or maybe she's working for Western Dental right now, and she wants to set up her own practice, and she really wants to live in San Diego, but has that gotten to be an almost impossibility? And would you advise her to drive an hour out of the city limits and go find a town of 5,000 that doesn't have any dentists? Or do you think that it still doesn't matter and you can still just walk out of uh, Midwestern Dental and open up a dental office in downtown San Diego and the and my in the lamp light is it lamp light district? Yeah, the gas lamp. The gas lamp district and still yeah. crush it or is that is it a different game than uh, when you and your wife graduated twenty years ago? Yeah, it's a different game. I, I think you know, um, is it is it AFCO where you can kind of decide or, or see how saturated a market is? Um, you know, if, if you have a, an established practice, I think, you know, you know, join, join that, but starting one from scratch, uh, yeah, good luck. Well, well that, is, that is an excellent point that if you're going to go into a highly saturated area like San Diego, then it's better to acquire a practice than it is to start a de novo. Yeah. We both totally agree on that. 
And if you're going to start a de novo from scratch, it's a lot easier to do it where the supply demand ratio is going to offer you over 25 or 2,800 patients per dentist. But man, you started de novo in an area that has a dentist for every 500 people. That is a slow, rocky start. Yeah. And those are the yeah. people that say, you know, marketing doesn't work. Marketing doesn't work. Right. Yeah, yeah, your demographics didn't work. So I would agree. If you're going to go into the gas lamp district, which got to be, God, that's a cool area. Um, and then last one, are you are you sad you're losing your football team? I'm pissed. Yeah, we're all pissed. Big time. Well, I, 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 I followed the Chargers my whole life. And, uh, you know, that the just the way that the owner um, – left the city i mean i see more people driving around with you know the lightning bolt on the back of their window with a circle and a line across it i mean anybody but the chargers now <laughs> we're ticked yeah and people don't realize i i saw you know you, you look at these major athletes in baseball and football that stick out their whole career in one city and it, it's priceless the way the city adopts them and then i've seen so many famous people in the nfl or the nba like their final year go somewhere else because they gave them a bigger paycheck so they sold out the hometown to yeah. go get this big paycheck for like a year and then right. they, lost, they lost their hometown yeah as a business to them it's emotional for us right 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 you know and you got you know you have businessmen making decisions and uh and then you have a uh, you know, we're, we're, we're supporting the team, you know, we're, it's, it's a hard thing for us. And it just, it, it doesn't mix. I remember the, the last, the, uh, the only time I went to a Chargers football game, I remember walking in there with four dentists and there was some policemen standing out there and we were talking to them and we said, Hey, we're just curious. Uh, we're dentists. Uh, what percent of your trouble in this stadium is just from people uh, drinking too much? And they go, well, that's all of them. It's all yeah. of them. They go, I'm not going to drag some sober guy out of this stadium because it's all of them. And I thought that yeah. was funny. Uh, when the Cardinals came here, the city was very against them having alcohol. So they didn't have any alcohol in the stadium when they were playing at ASU. And it wasn't yeah. until they got their own private stadium where they brought out all the beer and liquor. And it was a totally different football experience watching the Cardinals in a dry arena than it is going to the Arizona football uh, Cardinal Stadium in Glendale I bet. where the uh, homies are drinking beer. That's a totally. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, but don't hey. don't take your kids to a Raider game when they're playing the Chargers. It's ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Have a rock. Absolutely. Holiday. Thank you. Take care, Howard.